The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome to the Women in Depth podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Fiato. Join me as we explore the inner lives of women, their struggles, fears, hopes, and dreams. We'll go beneath the surface and take a deeper look at what is hidden, unknown, uncertain, and uncomfortable. Hi, and welcome back to the Women in Depth podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Stephanie Kreisberg, and she's going to be talking to us today about the experience of having a narcissistic mother, specifically what this is like for the child and the adult child, some of the dynamics inherent in this experience, what this can look like, as well as how to cope, and some of the misperceptions around the narcissistic mother and this experience. Dr. Stephanie Kreisberg is a clinical psychologist who helps parents, children, teens, and adults with narcissistic parents lead healthier, happier lives. She treats children, teens, and adults with anxiety disorders, including social anxiety, OCD, panic disorder, and phobias. Dr. Kreisberg has over 20 years experience with extensive training in the treatment of anxiety disorders and in the use of clinical hypnosis. Recently, she was honored to be elected as a member at large to the board of the New England Society for Clinical Hypnosis. She is the only therapist in New England certified in the model of therapy based on Will I Ever Be Good Enough? Healing the Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers by Dr. Carol McBride. Hi, Stephanie, and welcome. Hi, Lourdes. Thank you so much for having me, and I am delighted to be here. I am really grateful for this opportunity to have this conversation with you because this is a topic that I have personal experience with. It's also an area that I see frequently in my work as a therapist, and I know that in the broader perspective, it's also a more common experience than people realize. Yes, that's absolutely true. And one of the reasons that I really wanted to get into this work and to talk about it is that it's something that people don't talk about and that I mostly work with women, men as well, but people feel so isolated and alone with this problem. It's a secret a very painful secret. And so I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to talk about it because that helps people feel not so alone and isolated with this problem. How did you get drawn to this work? Well, that's a good question. I had been a practicing psychologist already for quite a long time. And I started to notice the patterns of narcissism in my own family. And then I happened upon the book by Dr. McBride about narcissistic mothers, and it was really life-changing for me. And then Dr. McBride offered training for therapists, and so I did that training. So when I offered this therapy, when I put this up on my website that I was doing therapy for people who had narcissistic parents, I didn't really know what to expect. And honestly, Lourdes, people just came out of the woodwork. Wow. And then I just realized how many people were suffering with this problem, but nobody talked about it. And that's what I learned when people started coming into my office, how alone, really ashamed people felt that they just couldn't talk about it to people in their lives. You know, Dr. McBride's book also was life-changing for me. Yes, it was really eye-opening for me. And, you know, what I learned is that I was not alone. So I've been working with women who have narcissistic mothers, but also people come in with all different sorts of situations, narcissists in their lives, whether it might be an in-law a boss, a coworker, a spouse, a former spouse. And I feel grateful to have the opportunity to give them a safe place to talk about this issue 
because there are a lot of myths out there about narcissists. So people come in and they have an opportunity to talk about what it's really like to deal with a narcissist in your life. So I want to start with some building blocks, just because the term narcissism has been, I think, more present in our social media and just in the, I guess, the vernacular of the day. And I wanted to be sure that as we talk about this topic, that our listeners uh, know what we mean when we use the term narcissist or narcissistic in this um, conversation. So could you share what it means um, when we describe someone as narcissistic? Sure, absolutely. So I know it's a term that gets tossed around a lot. And it's important to know a narcissist isn't someone who's just self-centered or likes to talk about themselves a lot. That isn't what we mean in in psychology by someone who is a, a narcissist. When we're talking in psychology about a narcissist, we're talking about someone whose personality, the fundamental core of their personality, has not fully matured into what we would call a fully mature adult. So this is someone who looks like an adult on the outside, but inside is much younger. And I find it's helpful to give people an understanding of what it means to have a healthy personality. So when we're growing up, just as we develop our motor skills and our learning and, you know, we grow into a full mature person, we grow emotionally and psychologically. And someone who has a personality disorder, that gets stunted somewhere along the way, their ability to have relationships, to know who they are as a person, to understand emotions, to empathize with other people, to have mature relationships. It's probably because of issues that happened in their own family growing up. And what's so confusing is, as I said, they look like a fully developed person on the outside, but inside a narcissist is someone who's much younger, maybe a young child, probably a preteen at best. Oftentimes I tell people they're like sort of an empty egg. If you can imagine taking an egg and cracking it and you open it and sort of like there's nothing inside where their adult emotions and are supposed to be, that's what you can kind of picture. So I like to use metaphors. And so an adult personality is needs to be flexible, right? So that when you come across difficult situations in life, that you can adapt to different situations. But unhealthy personalities, like a narcissistic personality, they are rigid. They can't be flexible and adapt to different situations. That's what it's like with a narcissist. And where they are rigid is in terms of they have great difficulty understanding and empathizing with other people's feelings. They have an unrealistic, rigid sense of themselves. They see themselves as very special, entitled to special treatment. So they have a hard time switching into the adult mode of functioning. So often what we see with narcissistic parents, rather than being able to be flexible and move into the adult role of a parent, they may expect to be taken care of by their child. They might be jealous of their children. They might need their children to take care of them rather than have be able to take care of their children. They might be envious of their children And the main characteristics that I see is often very highly critical of their children. They can't step back and let their children be children and make mistakes and be who they are. It's very hard for them to accept their children for who they are because so often they see their children as an extension of themselves. And if they don't reflect who they need them to be, because they are so rigid and inflexible, 
They often lash out, reject them, abandon them in some way. And it's often because they have this deep sense of emptiness and shame inside themselves. But as a child, you don't understand that. Of course you don't. And you grow up often with this deep sense of feeling, I must not be good enough. I'm not meeting my parents' needs. They're so angry at me. They think I'm not good enough. They're criticizing me. They're pushing me away. And that feeling really gets internalized inside the child as they grow up. Sometimes I tell people it's like their parent is sort of like a a stunted tree who never really had all the nutrients. You know, a tree needs to grow sunshine, water, nutritious soil. They never had all those things they needed to grow and they just get stunted. They're not healthy. So there's so many different ways that you can look at it that can help you understand that you weren't really raised by a fully mature healthy adult. And so often when I say this to clients, there's this look of recognition that goes off in their face. Like sometimes that's what it felt like. Like I was talking to, when I was a child, I felt like I was, or a teenager, I felt like I was talking to a 12 year old. And it's a sense of relief because they feel like I'm not crazy. I felt like I was crazy, but you weren't. And in some ways this It's also can, you know, kind of take some of the blame and burden off the parent who never got what they needed to fully develop into a fully mature person. They just didn't have the ingredients they needed to become a fully functioning adult. They may be able to function adequately, even very successfully in some aspects of their lives. They may be very successful at business or some parts of their life professionally, but interpersonally, no, they're not able to do it. And that's what can make it especially confusing for children, even for the adults who deal with them, because their functioning can be very sporadic and um, it's uh, inconsistent. So if there's someone listening and this is, you know, maybe starting to really click with them, what are some of the ways that you can determine if your parent is narcissistic. So if you have a narcissistic parent, what are some of the things that you as a person may experience is the most common things that I hear in my practice are having grown up and now as an adult, having this critical voice in your head all the time, constant sense of self-doubt, having a hard time feeling perhaps connect, really connected to other people, having a hard time really trusting yourself because you grew up with this constant sense of being criticized, your feelings not being seen or validated. So as you were growing up, you may have had a parent who was just constantly making kind of either really overt critical comments to you or perhaps very subtle digs at you. You may have had a parent who just wasn't able to take on the parent role, who just really didn't function as a parent, who was maybe perhaps ill a lot and expected you to take care of them or led a very flamboyant lifestyle and just sort of ignored your needs. You may have had a parent who just in more subtle way, just ignored your needs. You also may have just had a parent who really expected you to meet their mold of what they expected. So for example, I'm working right now with a woman who grew up in a family where everybody was very athletic and that's what was really valued. But she was not like that. She was artistic She did art, she danced, and her father could just not accept that at all. And anything that she tried to do was just completely devalued because she didn't meet the mold of being an athletic person and playing on teams. So whatever she did, there was no feeling of you are valued, you are cherished. So she grew up with just feeling worthless about herself. So those are some of the traits that you may see. It may be very overt or it may be more subtle. 
Another thing that's often reported is a feeling of envy and jealousy. So if you succeed, your parent might not be there to be happy for you. Most parents, when their child succeeds, they just feel wonderful about that. But because a narcissistic parent feels so bad about themselves inside, they're not able to feel good about their child. They, in fact, feel jealous. So they might make a disparaging comment if a child gets an award or gets a part in the school play. And that's really devastating to a child because they can't separate out. There's no boundaries. Narcissistic parents also tend to be very intrusive. They cannot have healthy boundaries between themselves and their children. And that may show up in many different ways, dressing or acting like their children, intruding on their relationships with their friends, reading their diaries. It's very hard for them to let their children, their teenagers, in appropriate ways, be their own people. These are some of the things, so lack of empathy, jealousy, criticalness, and lack of boundaries, so that the person just feels like, I am not my own person. I don't have the right to be my own person and to have my own opinions, my own feelings, and my own successes. Those are some of the hallmarks, and they really get carried into adulthood. Yeah. As you were describing those, Stephanie, I, I'm listening and, and I can see that, you know, in, in my, my clients' lives as well, the interference with relationships, the punishing or pushing away for the adult child expressing themselves or choosing to do something differently. Right. So for example, let's say somebody uh, is really excited because she worked really hard in high school and she got into so many colleges that she wanted to go to. So her mother, instead of saying, that's so wonderful, I'm so proud of you, you worked so hard, you really deserve this, said, well, I think that's because nobody from your high school really applied to those schools. So there, there really wasn't a lot of competition. Wow. That's the kind of thing that you might hear. I call it emotionally pulling the rug out from under you. And then the other, and this is a really important point, thing that happens a lot, and people hear this term a lot, is called gaslighting. That is something that happens to pretty much anyone who grows up with a narcissistic parent. And what that means is a denial of your child's or your teen's or even an adult child's reality or their feelings, which is really crazy making. For example, let's say this teenager I just mentioned, okay? So her mother tells her, oh, well, you got into college because those colleges, because really I don't think anyone else in your class applied to those. So there really wasn't a lot of competition. And then maybe as an adult or that teenager goes back later and says, you know, mom, that really hurt my feelings that you said that. You know, I think I, I worked really hard to get into those colleges. And the mother might say, I never said that you misheard me. I, I never said that. That is a very typical, we call that gaslighting, okay? And that means denying your experiences, your feelings. And then that daughter might come away feeling like, did she say that? Did I mishear that? Is there something yeah. wrong with me? Maybe I'm crazy because the mom is so adamant that she never said that. So then you have what I call the double whammy. Not only were your feelings so hurt, so deeply hurt, but then the reality of that experience is obliterated, is denied. It's a really painful thing to have to go through. Yeah. And I think too with that is also, if not flat out denying that that happened, you know, there, I think other variations also that I've seen are saying that that's not what was meant or that you're overreacting, or there's no response at all, the empathy, there's the lack of empathy. Right, there might be no response, like, right, there could be so, there's many variations to gaslighting. There could be another one is, you're too sensitive. Oh yeah, well, I did say that, but you're making too big a deal out of it. You are too sensitive. So 
what does that leave this child, this teen with? Well, I am too sensitive. My feelings are too much. I better squash them down. And so throughout life, you learn to squash your feelings, to second guess your feelings, to think that your feelings don't matter. And that can lead to some really difficult patterns throughout life, you know, to be in relationships and to always put your feelings last. That leads to some really difficult patterns in adult relationships to always feel like my feelings don't matter. My partner's feelings come first. I don't matter. You can be vulnerable to, you know, winding up in in a relationship with a narcissist. So those are some really important patterns to be aware of or experiences because once you recognize them, there is some hope. You know, we can, we can improve upon them. But that's why so many people who are raised with narcissists just constantly have this self-doubt in their minds because they really grew up with this, feeling like the, the rug is constantly being pulled out, the emotional rug is being pulled out from under them. The other common pattern is there's really this disconnect between private and public. So often all these behaviors are at home, going on behind closed doors. So the narcissistic parent may be very different out in the world, in public, with their friends, at their jobs, and the child, the teen, the adult might hear, parent is so nice. I just ran into her. We had the greatest conversation at the grocery store. Or, you know, your dad is just the greatest boss. Just love him. And so the this person, the child or the adult child grows up feeling even more maybe crazy, ashamed. What's wrong with me? I can't talk about it. Or if they are brave enough to express to someone what their experience has truly been, They often are, in fact, really told, oh, that's horrible. How can you treat your parent that way? How can you talk about your your parent that way? And many of my clients have gotten that feedback from other people. And so they're even more likely to want to go underground with their experiences. It's almost like the um, the public version that um, is out there about their narcissistic parent when those people say these things, like what you're saying, it just compounds the gaslighting and the denial of the adult child's reality even more. Right. And I think especially because, you know, we do live in a culture. I mean, it's not just our culture. It's just part of, you know, our, yeah, it's just part of our culture that we're supposed to respect our parents. And I understand that that's important, but sometimes that relationship does not work. And then it really is important important for the the children or the teen or the adult child to figure out what do I need to do differently? How can I protect myself and my own family? And I find that many people um, come to my practice at the milestone moments in their lives, such as, you know, planning a wedding, having a child, things like that, where they're really trying to figure out how am I going to build my own life? What are my values? Or how do I want to protect my own children? And what kind of family do I want to have? Because they don't want to repeat the same patterns that they grew up with. And I think too, you know, Stephanie, maybe you can share a little bit more about this. I think what adds to the challenge of not wanting to talk about this, or it's only, you know, when you reach these milestones that someone is able to truly look at this in a way that is healing for themselves as they move forward is that many narcissists, I believe, are able to have the type of um, outward persona where they do appear very successful. They are people who are respected. They have positions in their community. And with that, it also makes it difficult for the adult child to really even complain in the sense or, or, or be picking on their parent or be critical because, the, you know, they'll say, wow, my mom or dad is this person and I had a roof over my head in some cases. They've provided for me. They just want me to do their best. They care. So it's just this vicious circle, you know, that just 
compounds all the challenges. That's right. And that's why so often with the adult children, really, there's the sense of shame, the sense I've, I'm not good enough. And often the adult children really can remain isolated from other people. They don't share their story. Thanksgiving rolls around and, and you know, it's, and everyone's talking about, oh, I can't wait, you know, for my get together with my family. And it's really hard to say, I'm not including my mother or you're planning a wedding and you're saying, I'm not going to invite my mother to my wedding, things like that. These are things that are not socially acceptable. Yeah. And one of my clients once told me, and I'll, I'll never forget it. She said to me, we're like a secret society. And, um, and I thought, yeah, that's really true. Um, so many people come in and feel like they're a member of a secret society, men or women who can't feel connected to their parents. Yeah. And it's very painful. You know, one of the memories that came to my mind as you were sharing this is, you know, for me growing up, my mom was very active in our community. And so when I did share some of my struggles with community leaders, people at church, I think they truly didn't believe me. They just couldn't imagine that what I was sharing was what was happening in our home. And even family members going to relatives who, you know, aunts, uncles, they just also couldn't see that part as well. So it was very isolating. And you do start to realize that I can't talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. In my case, when I once shared something as an adult, decades after growing up with a childhood friend who had known me for years, she said, wow. She said, you never said a word about this. And, you know, I've known her since I was 11. She said, you never said a word. I said, I know. That's how I felt like I just could not share this. Not when the parents were all in the same social circle and professional circles and religious circles. I just knew that that was my job to keep this a secret. Yeah. I wanted to shift gears and move into the coping piece now. Mm -hmm. How does one cope with a narcissistic parent once they realize that this is what's happening and, you know, they're, they're adults now. So there are a few more options. There's a little bit more power than when they were a child or a teenager living under their parents' roof. That's a great question. You know, the first thing is what we've been talking about. It's really important to get education because you really have to understand what you're dealing with because that's the only thing that's going to make you start to feel whole and healthy, not crazy, not isolated, is to understand this phenomenon. That's the first step in feeling like you can move forward. So once you have some of that under your belt, you know, I find people come in with, you know, such a kind of agitated nervous systems, feeling anxious, always doubting themselves. One woman told me, you know, I just have this critical voice playing in my head. I hear her voice the first thing I wake up in the morning it's really important to start to learn some skills to calm down your nervous system. So we work on some mindfulness, relaxation techniques. So you can kind of start to lay down some new tracks in your body for feeling more calm and centered. I find people doing some guided visualization where they can really picture a new, start to picture a new future for themselves using their imaginations is very helpful. Really deciding, I use a lot of tools from, you know, different therapies, really deciding what are their values? What's really important to them? How do they want to live their life? And figuring that out is really lays the groundwork for how they want to move forward. So I'll give you an example. Let's say someone's struggling with, I really don't want to be in contact with my father so much. It's so disruptive to my family, but I feel guilty. I feel so guilty if I don't see him, if I don't, you know, invite him over for dinner every month. But then she, you know, she decides, he or she decides that having a peaceful family life is, with my own family, is one of my core values. And she can really hold on to that value. That really helps her let go of some of her guilt 
and make the decisions that she needs to make around setting boundaries. And then she's able to trust herself because this decision is based on what is truly important to her. Absolutely. So the goal is to find, to turn, I call it turning down that critical voice and finding your own voice. How do you find your own voice? And all these tools, you know, thank you for saying that because all these tools serve the purpose of helping you find your own voice. Calming down your nervous system helps you step back from those thoughts using mindfulness, meditation, relaxation, so you can learn how do I set boundaries? How do I live a life that's guided by my values and what I want? And maybe, you know, if my parent is still alive, maybe I'll have them in my life a little, maybe a lot, maybe not at all. Maybe I have no choice. You know, some people have a very ill parent and there's no one else to care for them. And they feel like I I have to be involved with my parent. But they can make choices that feel right for them. And that's a very different way of going through life than just feeling I have no choices. I'm a bad person. I just have to do what other people want. I'm so glad that you shared this because I think that basic question of do I go no contact with the narcissistic parent? Do I go partial contact? And with all of this, the guilt, that's, that's a feature I see too all the time is guilt over conflicts, guilt over what I did wrong, which goes with the questioning. And so I love that, you know, you're bringing up how important it is to be able to hear the voice of your true values and honoring that voice and that you can do this in a way that works for you and still, you know, in this example, if you have a parent who needs your care, you can still honor your values in in some way while addressing what you need to do for your parent. Exactly. And, um, you know, the recording that that I sent, that's a, a free gift for people. It's a guided visualization about tapping into your wise self. And your wise self is your intuition, okay? It's your own inner voice. And it helps you in this visualization, helps you go back in time into a place, to a time when you handled, already handled the situation that was challenging, using your own strengths and resources, because you already have, you already have handled hard times. And how did you do it? And learning to listen to your own intuition because we all have that and my wise voice isn't the same as yours or somebody else's and learning to sort of clear out the smog so to speak and the chatter so that you can trust yourself and really identify the strengths that you have and supports and resources so that you can do that. And that also involves for many people who have narcissistic parents is, you know, really learning how to assert themselves, how to be able to speak up for themselves. I call it respectful adult communication, how to say what they need and feel okay about it and set boundaries. And that can be really hard because when you're raised by a narcissistic parent, you feel like you have no voice. You might get really agitated when you have to express yourself, or you might just say nothing. So we also practice, how do I stand up for myself in a way that feels right for me? Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, the the gift that you're offering our listeners is meditation. We're going to put it in the show notes so that listeners can access it and, and use this. I wanted to ask you a few questions that were sent in by um, listeners who who knew that we would be having this conversation. And I just asked, you know, if you have any questions that you'd like to me to ask Dr. Kreisberg, just let me know. And so if it's okay with you, I'd like to go through some of these. Absolutely. So one of the questions was, does a narcissistic parent care if they see their children or grandchildren or family? Hmm. Good question. Often, I think absolutely they do care. Sometimes they don't. It depends on the person. 
Unfortunately, what I have seen in my experience is that their behavior might be really inappropriate and might make it difficult for the parent to feel like I feel comfortable having them around my children, at least for any extensive period of time. So it might seem like they don't care because they behave so inappropriately. So I think it really depends on the person. And I think the most important thing is for you as a parent to feel like I feel safe, I feel comfortable, and if I don't, I can speak up about it and that I can manage the situation in a way that feels right to me and that I feel like I'm doing right by my children. And then this is almost, I think, a, like an extension of this first question, and, and I think you've touched on it a little bit, but... How can someone protect themselves during time spent with a narcissistic parent? And then how can someone recover after time spent with a narcissistic parent? Okay. Well, if you, you know, need to spend time with a a narcissistic parent and it's not pleasant, it's difficult for you, here's several different options. One is to do your best to do it on your terms, all right? One, keep it short and sweet. You know, you don't have to spend long periods of time and figure out what will work for you. For instance, let me give you an example. So one woman I worked with, you know, the whole family was getting together for dinner at a restaurant And someone said, oh, I'll come pick you up. And she thought about it and she thought, no, I'm not going to do that. I want to be able to leave when I want to leave if I don't feel comfortable. Okay. So really stand up for yourself. Think about what will work for you. Another thing is you don't have to engage. I think this is one of the most important things with your narcissistic parents' comments, their critical comments. I think one of the most important thing is to know that I probably didn't say before is that your narcissistic parent isn't going to change. Another metaphor I like is they see the world through narcissistic colored glasses, not rose colored glasses, narcissistic colored glasses. So I know often hope springs eternal and we feel like If I just say the right thing, they'll understand or maybe they'll get it this time or it's just tempting to just try to get them to see things in a logical way. It never works. So I recommend just saying things like, let's say mom says, oh, you look like you gained weight. Yeah, things like that. Just like non-comments, don't take the bait, okay? Take deep breaths. Don't engage. Just ignore it. Tune it out. Remember that you're talking to someone who just really, their brain is stuck. It's just stuck. They're not able to empathize or see things. They're not going to get it. So no matter what you do, it's just better to just say, ah, yeah, I guess I gained weight or "Mm, pass the salt. So you'll come away ultimately feeling a lot calmer. And so if I think that you can do those things, it will be easier to recover after an interaction. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. You can still leave and just feel like you've been hit by a truck or, you right. know, I, I, <laughs> I know that, okay? I'm yeah. not saying those tips are going to make it a piece of cake. So be good to yourself. If there's somebody you can reach out to and, you know, just say, oh, my gosh, you would not believe this, you know, dinner we just had. Talk to that person. Do something nice for yourself. Remind yourself this is not about you. It so isn't about you. Okay. You really need to remind yourself about that and be good to yourself. Okay. So those are some of my tips. That was really helpful, Stephanie. The next question is, what are some areas that I need to look for or blind spots 
so that I myself don't develop narcissistic qualities in my own parenting if I've had a narcissistic parent? Okay, that is also a really good question. And I know one that comes up a lot. One of the things that I see is that when you grow up with a very critical parent, you might go in one of two ways. You might tend to be a little critical yourself. You know, you might want to look out for if you have that tendency that that voice kind of escapes. So you can be on the lookout for that. However, the other side of the coin might also happen. And what we know is that in parenting, this is one thing pretty much, believe it or not, all psychologists agree with, that the best guide to parenting is to be warm and empathic, but also to have limits and guidelines and rules. That's been shown over decades. You don't want to be too loosey-goosey, but you also don't want to be harsh and strict. So if you grew up with a really harsh, critical parent, you might tend to be, you know, I want to be their friend. I want to be super close. I don't want to have too many rules. And we know that that's not good for kids either. They do need a parent to be a parent and to step in sometime and say no and have limits that helps kids feel safe. So you want to look for that tendency also to sort of overcorrect from your parent. I would say to look out for those two things. And then the last question we have is, how does a narcissistic parent experience or process no contact from her children or her siblings? Well, it doesn't usually go over that well. Because they're not able to, it's very difficult for them to empathize. We do know, I just want to say as an aside, we know that narcissistic parents are often, it's not that they're incapable of empathy, it's inconsistent. But most likely they are going to blame you, feel it's your fault, there's something wrong with you. They're not likely to step back and say, oh, I get it, I understand my my role in these things. Because if they could, you probably wouldn't be needing to go no contact. So again, um, I think it's really important to just hold on to your values about why you're doing it, about why it's so important. And it's not realistic, probably, that you're ever going to get your parent to see your side of things, as painful as that is. I also tell people, you know, nothing is set in stone. You know, you might decide for a while to go no contact and then reconsider at some later point, okay? You know, you never have to feel like I did it and then I have to stick with it for the rest of my life. Things change and that's okay too. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Your insights are so helpful and I know that our listeners are really going to appreciate everything that you've shared today. If there's someone who's listening who really wants to learn more and possibly even may want to work with you, what are the best ways that they get they can get in touch with you and find you? And also, do you have any favorite books or websites that you would recommend? Well, as I said, I really like Dr. McBride's book. I'm also a fan of reading certain novels or memoirs that help you feel connected, not alone. I like one called Wild Game by Adrian Brodeur, novels by Danny Shapiro. She writes about having had a narcissistic mother in novel form. And so I think those are really great. And you can read about those. I have reviews on my website. And my website is um, drstephaniekreisberg.com and my Twitter are all really good ways to get in contact with me. And we'll make sure to include all of those resources in the show notes so that listeners can find them and find you as well. Stephanie, thank you so much for taking the time today. I know it's been a process for us to make this interview happen, and I'm just so grateful for your patience and for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. It's um, been my pleasure and an honor, and um, thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening to the Women in Depth podcast. I hope it brings you a deeper understanding of yourself and others, and that you found some insights that illuminated and inspired. 
If you like what you hear, please consider supporting Women in Depth with a one-time or recurring donation. Any amount is appreciated and helps us continue to provide free, quality content for the world. If donating resonates with you, you can find the donation link on today's show notes. You can also follow Women in Depth on Facebook and YouTube, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe on iTunes. Again, thank you so much for listening, and see you next time.